There's a story from the canon that Ajahn Sawat liked to tell. There was a time when the Buddha went to stay in the haunt of the Alawakayaka, the spirit, who took offense at the fact that the Buddha was there. I told him to get out. And so the Buddha left. And the spirit told him to come back in again. So he came in, told him to get out a second time. This happened three times altogether. And then when the Buddha came in for the third time, then the Yaka told him to leave, and the Buddha said, No, I'm not going to leave. You're asking too much. So the Yaka challenged the Buddha. He said, I'm going to ask you some questions, and if you can't answer the questions, I'm going to hurl you across the river to Ganges and split your head into seven pieces. And the Buddha said, I don't know anyone who can hurl me across the river of Ganges or split my head, so go ahead and ask the questions. So the Yaka asked him some questions. And the Buddha answered to the Yaka's satisfaction. The final question, or the final answer, had to do with four qualities to develop in the mind. Truth, self-control, endurance, and relinquishment, or generosity. I think one of the reasons that John Sweat liked this story it was because the Buddha was compliant. He wasn't stubborn, but when it came to what was proper, he stood his ground. This is very much a character of John Sweat. He was compliant in a lot of ways, but when it came to a matter of what was right or wrong, he stood his ground firmly. It wasn't because he was bullheaded, because he was very clear about what was right and what was wrong. As for the Buddha's final answer, that's become a famous set of dhammas, set of qualities. It's listed in a dhamma textbook in Thailand as qualities appropriate for lay people, but they're appropriate for everybody. The late king of Thailand, Rama the Ninth, when they celebrated the 200th anniversary of Bangkok, gave a talk. and The four qualities were the basic theme of the talk. Which is saying that if Thai people develop these qualities, the nation would prosper. Of course, the same holds everywhere. Here in America, if our leaders followed these qualities, the nation would prosper. If the people followed these qualities, it would prosper. Not only in terms of material wealth, but also in terms of the quality of life, the quality of our living together. Because they're all qualities in which you Take responsibility for your actions, responsibility for your words. You stand by them. And the fact that you stand by them is not simply out of stubbornness, but because they're right. For instance, with truth. Truth is a quality, not just of the words you say, although that is important. When people don't tell the truth, it's very hard to live with one another. But it's also a quality of the person. You have to be true to the practice if you're going to get good results. The people come and meditate, and they go back and they say, well, I tried meditation and it didn't work. The question is, did they really meditate? Were they true in doing the meditation? If you're going to evaluate the Dharma, you have to be true. You have to give what it requires. This too is a quality of truthfulness. There's another quality that the Buddha calls safeguarding the truth, or guarding the truth, in which whatever opinions you have, you're very clear about why you're holding them. You don't simply say that. Well, it's, I see it, it's true, so it must be true. You have to ask yourself, is it because you're, you reasoned it through and it seemed to fit in with what you already believe? Or are you taking it on somebody's authority? Those are not grounds for something's being true or false. So it teaches you to have a certain humility about your opinions. which would be good in the world. People are very sure about their opinions, based on flimsier and flimsier evidence. 
again, it gets hard to talk to one another. But if you're clear about where you get your opinion, then you begin to realize, okay, this is something I, I have to test. Just because it seems right to me, or it sounds good, or I believe the authority. There have to be things you have to test. Now, there are a lot of opinions we have about things that we can't test. And so there's opinions you should bracket. The important opinions are the ones that the things you can test as to what's going to give rise to suffering, what's not going to give rise to suffering. If you're true in that test, then you really know the truth. So that's one quality that would help us prosper, help the society prosper in terms of the quality of our life together. The second one is self-control. You restrain yourself. Something pops into your mind, you don't immediately do it or say it. You ask yourself, what will be the long-term consequences of following this particular idea? This is especially important with defilements like greed, aversion, and delusion. You have to stop and ask yourself, if I act on these emotions, what will the results be? And you have to learn how to hold yourself in check when you see that the results will be bad. This, the Buddha said, is a quality of discernment. In other words, when you see something that you don't like to do, but you know it will give good results, you can talk yourself into doing it. You know how to psych yourself out. Or if there's something that you like doing, but it's going to get bad results, you can talk yourself out of doing it. That's discernment in the pragmatic sense, the kind of discernment that really matters. You look throughout the Buddhist teachings, and for him, discernment is always strategic. Even the more abstract teachings on emptiness or dependent core arising, they serve a strategic purpose. It's learning how to use them properly is a sign of true discernment. You don't just parrot what's in the books. You know that a particular teaching has what the Buddha called its atta, its, its goal, its purpose, its meaning. What is it for? And so you apply it at the, pro the appropriate time, and then you put it aside at the times that are not appropriate. There are only two teachings the Buddha gave that he said that are always true across the board, categorically true. One is the principle that skillful action should be abandoned. Excuse me, skillful action should be developed. Unskillful action should be abandoned. And actions there covers not only physical actions but also the, the words you say and the thoughts you think. And then the other teaching is the Four Noble Truths and the duties appropriate to them: to comprehend suffering, abandon its cause, realize the cessation of suffering by developing. The path to the cessation. Those are the only teachings that the Buddha said are true across the board. Other teachings he said you have to know the proper time and place. So it's a sign that this discernment that he taught, the concepts he taught, were meant to be strategic. You know when to use them, and you know how to talk yourself into doing the right thing. That's how discernment connects with self-control. The third quality, stamina or endurance. You learn how to put up with difficulties. You put up with people's harsh words, unpleasant words. You put up with pain. Because if you allow yourself to be easily influenced by these things, other people can know how to influence you. They know where your buttons are. They're all over your face. They're all over your body, ready to be pushed. But if you have a measure of self-control, again, this goes together. Excuse me, measure of endurance. 
This goes together with self-control. You can hold yourself back, even though people say things that are really provoking. You develop the equanimity to not get provoked. And that puts you in a position where you can more clearly see what should be said, what would be the most effective, useful thing to say at a particular time. The same with physical pain, when you're not afraid of physical pain. then you're not easily pushed around. So it puts you more in a position of power, a position of strength. Then when you don't react with knee-jerk reactions to difficulties, then when situations are difficult, you can smooth them out. Calm them down. Instead of inciting people to further turmoil, you can take a situation and unravel it. So you can end peacefully. So it's a good quality to have, again, for peace. And then finally, relinquishment which can also be translated as generosity. You realize that you have more than enough in terms of your material wealth, in terms of your time, in terms of your energy. It may not be unlimited, but you have enough to share. And when people can share things like this, society becomes a useful thing. When people are just constantly grabbing for themselves, for themselves, for themselves, taking what they can. You begin to wonder, why live together? What do we gain? Some people gain, some people are deprived. But even the ones who gain don't gain much in terms of the qualities of their minds. It's when we share, the life together becomes a better life. And we grow as individuals. So these are the four qualities that the Buddha taught of the yaka. Now yakas are for their anger and for their impetuousness. These are precisely the qualities that not only yakas, but human beings have that get them into a lot of trouble, create a lot of turmoil. These are precisely the qualities that counteract the tendency that would lead to more turmoil. These are the qualities that can take turmoil and turn it back to peace. If we sit around waiting for everybody else in society to develop them, it's never going to happen. They have to start with us. We have to learn how to be truthful, how to exert self-control, how to develop our stamina and endurance, and how to learn to be more generous. In other words, we become mature, responsible human beings. The kind of human beings in which a, a livable society becomes possible. So we look at the news, and it's pretty sad. But we shouldn't stop with sadness. We should realize there are qualities that we can develop that can make at least our immediate environment a good place to be. By the way, we develop these strengths within ourselves, so that our life together becomes conducive to the good things of the mind. The mind's genuine goodness is genuine happiness. Genuine in the sense that it's really lasting and goes deep, deep into the mind and the heart.